Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out this afternoon. I'm thrilled to introduce our two guests today, but first, just a quick housekeeping note or two. Um, this event is being live webcast and recorded, so we will have a Q&A portion. Just make sure you know that that will be preserved for posterity. We are also selling a couple copies of the book in the back. They're $35, and uh, we accept cash and check. Unfortunately, uh, we are not enabled to take Bitcoin at this time, but <laughs> we hope to go get there someday. Um, we'll also be holding uh, a, a small reception downstairs in the pub afterwards with some food and light refreshments. Um, so I hope you'll join us for that. Um, but it's my pleasure to introduce our two guests, Primavera and Aaron, who just finished this amazing book, Blockchain and the Law. Um, Primavera is a faculty associate with the Berkman Klein Center, and uh, we're grateful that she brought her co-author as well. Um, and hopefully today's discussion and presentation will be uh, amazing and enlightening. Thank you so much. Hey everyone, thanks so much for, uh, for coming to hear a little bit more about our book. Um, so we're really just hoping to describe to you just a, a little bit about uh, blockchain technology. We're assuming that there's some familiarity with blockchain technology. That's gonna be kind of our supposition. And then just kind of explore um, you know, the core thesis in our book, which is that ultimately this technology um, is regulatable and that there's some avenues for regulation. So we're hoping to explore that. We, we want to make this a pretty dynamic uh, conversation. So we'll have a short 30 minute or so presentation and then uh, hopefully open it up to everyone else for questions and also um, answer any questions that you may have. So really, you know, what makes this technology so special? Um, and we're focused primarily on public blockchains, not permissioned or private blockchains. And I think when you think about it deeply, uh, there, these te this technology has some unique characteristics. You know, first, it's effectively a database or data structure that's running on a peer-to-peer -peer network. So a lot like the internet, it's global and transnational. So it operates anywhere where the internet is accessible. Um, and that has uh, some challenges when it comes to, to regulation. At the same time, because it's a database that's massively replicated off of a number of different, uh, across a number of different computers, it's highly resilient. So there's copies of all this transactional data on a blockchain, and that's stored on various different nodes. Those nodes are scattered across the globe. Uh, so for example, on the Bitcoin blockchain, I think there's about 12,000 or 20,000 nodes where there's exact copies of all the Bitcoin transactions that have occurred. And there's also an interesting a mechanism that all these public blockchain-based systems use called the consensus mechanism. There's different variations like proof of work and proof of stake. And the way that these networks come to consensus actually enables them to create tamper-resistant data for the, really for the first time. So thinking about you know, files that you may have on your computer, they're kind of flimsy, you can lose them. Here we have a data structure where once you store information in a blockchain, it's really, really hard uh, to change that information or to reverse uh, that transactional uh, data. At the same time, because it's on a peer-to-peer -peer network, it's transparent, right? There's all this information that's flowing back and forth between all these computers that are supporting the network, and there's certain information that gets, um, that gets disclosed as part of that activity. And at the same time, it relies on all this, uh, these cryptographic techniques to enable all the records to be digitally signed. So one way to think about a blockchain is actually, particularly the Bitcoin blockchain, is as a, as a chain of digitally signed transactions. So we know actually which accounts are the ones engaging in the transactions at any point in time. Blockchains are also synonymous, so you don't necessarily need to identify you as an individual to the network in order to participate in it. You really just need to have an address, and you can kind of think about it as an email address. I can create an email address where I identify me, and you know it's, it's my address. At the same time, I could create some sort of pseudonym and interact with these, these systems. And the last, uh, the last two interesting pieces are the incentive mechanisms in place. So there's an emerging field of economics called crypto economics where that rely on these blockchain-based systems or are examining these blockchain-based systems because there's a whole bunch of very interesting interactions that are emerging between the various different parties in the network. And last, on more advanced blockchains, most notably today, Ethereum, you can actually not just store tamper-resistant uh, records, you can also run uh, potentially autonomous code. So code that is executed by all these different computers across the network. So it's kind of this mix of unique characteristics that actually makes blockchains interesting and actually makes them interesting from a regulatory perspective. So we learned with the kind of birth of the, the internet uh, that you know, there's some new um, ways in which online services uh, are beginning to influence our lives. Uh, there was this concept of Lex Informatica which is basically code is law, 
where we learn that online intermediaries increasingly shape our lives. They set forth rules. They're usually inter uh, uh, imposed by intermediaries, and that in uh, influences the way we behave on the internet. And we learn that we can also influence the way that these intermediaries operate by applying regulations on those intermediaries. So if we decide how data is going to be maintained or controlled, we can actually influence the way data is collected and the way that data is processed. With blockchains, because of the ability to actually store and run uh, potentially autonomous code uh, we've, uh, and, and highly distributed bits of software, uh, we've discovered, and this is something that we explore deeply in our book, that there's an, another type of law that's emerging, something that we call Lex Cryptographica. Uh, one way to think about this is that these networks actually enable a whole bunch of different people to create order without actually having a legal regulatory framework that's underpinning it. So we can use these systems to order our behavior, not based on bureaucratic, state-based rules, but instead rules that are encapsulated and enforced via these blockchain-based systems. And we think that this is a potent new tool uh, to govern human behavior. So moving away from bureaucratic states to more uh, to systems that are governed more and more by, by these code-based mechanisms. So just think about Bitcoin as an example here. You have the Bitcoin blockchain, which is effectively a central bank that's administering a payments network, but yet there's no laws that are necessarily supporting it. It's all code-based rules and these little smart contract programs. So what's the impact? So we really uh, spend a great deal of time in the book examining What's the impact of this Lex Informatica uh, or um, Lex Cryptographica's impact? And one is, and this is what I think many folks are beginning to uh, think about with blockchain technology, is its capacity to disintermediate, to actually thin out the need for certain intermediaries. We can create code-based systems and rely on these, uh, these distributed networks to actually lessen the need for traditional intermediaries, but particularly in areas like in the financial services industry, because blockchains are showing to or have been shown to actually do a fairly good job of storing a number of assets. Things like virtual currencies or these ERC-20 tokens which are beginning to, to emerge. At the same time, um, the Lex Cryptographica's impact could also apply to automation and autonomy. So we can imagine seeing uh, these uh, smart contract programs and other, all these other distributed systems uh, help facilitate increasingly automated transactions that are managed through peer-to-peer -peer networks. And that could include value exchange, things like uh, virtual currencies like Bitcoin and Ether, uh, other tokenized uh, representations, even things like votes or other forms of social coordination. So uh, I think that's going to be one of the longer term impacts. And so following those specific characteristics, then the question is to which extent this uh, Lex Cryptographica is actually uh, complying or to which extent it actually managed to escape from uh, specific regulation. And uh, we can see already that because of the pseudonymity, because of the tamper resistance, and because of this potential autonomy of uh, a blockchain-based system, then we are already seeing quite some issues with regard to existing regulations. So we have seen, like, in the context of Bitcoin, for instance, there is all the question about can, like, can this technology be used for money laundering and things like this. We have seen the emergence of uh, decentralized marketplaces where we can actually rely on like the, the pseudonymity of Bitcoin in order to purchase potentially uh, illegitimate I items. And then recently we have seen this, um, the possibility of actually storing within the Bitcoin blockchain or any other blockchain uh, particular information which is itself illegitimate. So whether this is copyright infringement, whether this is like pedophilia and so forth. And then finally, of course, like there is this uh, big question because of this uh, tamper resistant feature of the blockchain based system, then um, how does it actually interact with the right to be forgotten, which might require the actual uh, removal of specific content? And so, what we can see is that there is this kind of interesting uh, distinction or like some kind of wall between uh, the rule of law and the rule of the code. And so what we explore in, in the book is like what is the interplay between those two and to which extent one is actually um, taking over the other. And so in the case of property law, this is, uh, we, can, we can quite easily uh, identify the problem to the extent that property laws are actually defined by the law. And because of this, they also can be taken away by the law. So if I have acquired a particular property illegitimately because it has been stolen or whatever, then a court order can actually decide that I should not be the legitimate owner of this property and therefore seize my property. Whereas when we move into those blockchain-based systems, then we have this 
concept of blockchain-based property or crypto property, which do not actually follow the same rules. And in this case, because the crypto property is actually not being defined by the legal system, it's actually defined by the code, and therefore it can only be taken away by the code, which means that even if I am illegitimately acquiring a Bitcoin or any other kind of crypto asset, then no matter what the law will say, no one can actually seize this asset, or at least not with the traditional enforcement mechanism, unless there is a particular provision in the code which will actually enable this seizure. And then same thing when we look at contract law. So we can see how traditional contract law is based on specific legal rules which uh, uh, are designed to actually reflect the intention of the party. So it's not necessarily the language of the contract, but it's actually the intention that matters. And this intention will be enforced by a third party authority. Whereas in, when we move into a blockchain-based system and in, we enter into the context of smart contract, then again, the, the actual contractual relationship is defined by the code of the smart contract and is no longer really able to account for what is the real intention of the party is only looking at what is the actual wording of the code and it does no longer require this third party enforcement authority in order to actually enforce the contract because the provision of the contract will be automatically executed by the smart contract code. And so the question that we explore in the book is are we actually, through those new system of blockchain-based system and Lex Cryptographica, are we perhaps going back to the same visions that uh, were brought about in the beginning of the, in the early internet days, where we had uh, people like Timothy May or John Perring Barlow that actually envisioned this kind of uh, new digital anarchy or this cyberspace, which was considered to be an unregulatable space where state and government simply could not actually exert their sovereignty over it. And uh, even though we have seen that these, these initial visions somehow did not actually materialize in the same way as many of us would have thought, um, we, can, we can wonder whether those new technological systems might actually help uh, not only bringing back the same vision, but perhaps actually help implement them in a way that the internet has actually failed to implement. And so when we look at uh, the way in which the internet has evolved, we can see that it used to be, it was bringing back those ideas of freedom of emancipation, but then quite quite soon it has been understood that it's actually quite easy to regulate the internet because we can actually regulate the operator, the intermediaries that are actually controlling the platforms on which people interact. Now, the question then is how within this new context in which we have disintermediation and potentially automation, then to some extent it becomes much more hard to leverage the traditional tools of regulation that we had with the internet because simply we can no longer so easily identify what is the actual object of regulation. So we can no longer regulate the platform operator because it, everything is operated through this decentralized and disintermediated network. But of course, and this is the, the big part of the book, uh, a blockchain is not an island um, in the sense that it does not subsist on its own. It actually exists within a much larger ecosystem. And even though we cannot use the same traditional ways of regulation, we can actually identify new ways to actually regulate those systems. Yeah. And one thing to, to realize as we begin to think about, you know, how can we begin to place pressure on these blockchain-based systems or where can regulation attach, it's important to recognize that uh, blockchains, they're built upon the existing internet, right? So if you need to transmit or store information on a blockchain, you're still going to have to rely on various different intermediaries that current exi currently exist. So any information that's getting recorded on a blockchain will have to pass through at some point uh, an internet service provider, ISP, um, which can apply packet filtering techniques or other techniques to uh, limit uh, access to blockchain-based networks. Uh, you're also going to have to find any application or service that's relying on a blockchain. Uh, so you're going to have to presumably identify those through various different in intermediaries and information intermediaries in particular. And we're already seeing uh, that some of these information intermediaries, uh, folks like Google, uh, Facebook, MailChimp, they're beginning to censor certain activity that's occurring on the networks. So for example, 
uh, all those services that I just mentioned are not providing advertisement related to token sales or the sale of these ERC-20 tokens, which many of you may have heard of. And that's one way to begin to limit some of the use and widespread distribution of the technology. At the same time, we're going to see the emergence of new intermediaries, and we've already seen some newer intermediaries emerge that rely on blockchain technology that are not necessarily completely decentralized or distributed, but really are just companies that are interacting with this data structure. One notable one is exchanges. So if you need to buy or sell or, or trade any of the assets that are being managed via blockchain, well, you have to go through an exchange. And uh, many of those exchanges are centrally maintained. They're backed by large venture capital funds and look like they're on a path to become publicly traded companies. And in the US in particular, we've already seen that regulations are being applied on those central, uh, centralized exchanges in order to limit some of the activity that's going on. So even though Bitcoin itself was not designed to comply with AML, Know Your Customer, other financial regulations, we're seeing that the exchanges are applying it uh, before they, they enable any party on their system to begin to uh, facilitate some of the trades. Uh, at the same time, we've seen that uh, in order to process transactions on a blockchain, uh, there's various parties known as miners that are the ones that validate those transactions, and they're not completely decentralized. Instead, they've kind of coordinated around these mining pools, and for Bitcoin and Ethereum, there's only a handful of these mining pools that control the entire network. Uh, so that's another area where we can see regulations attaching in order to shape the, to, in order to shape the development of the technology. And we've already seen some jurisdictions begin to explore whether or not they can apply regulation on these mining pools. So for example, in China, there's been attempts to actually begin to tax these mining pools in a way uh, to either collect some of the profits that they're generating, but you can imagine taxes being imposed to shape the way that these mining pools develop. Uh, at the same time, uh, other jurisdictions have looked to mining, mining pools, like for example, Venezuela, in order to understand what's going on within the network. So you can imagine additional laws and regulations being uh, applied in order to shape the, the way that these uh, uh, way that these blockchain based networks develop and then alternative avenue for regulation is obviously the um, the most uh, radical one which is basically criminalizing users so basically saying that it is illegitimate for a particular individual to run a blockchain node or perhaps to interact with a particular account or with a particular smart contract or uh, basically just identifying the various uh, um, activities that will actually be reprimanded. And um, this is actually quite a, a, a critical question because we have already seen in the past, in, especially in the context of copyright law, how criminalizing end user is actually, first of all, quite problematic, but also it's really difficult. And it might actually lead to requiring external interventions, so providing more surveillance, providing actually like monitoring of activity in order to be able to catch uh, those individuals. And especially in the context of a disintermediated and pseudonymous system, and this means that if we decide to regulate the end user, we need to actually change the infrastructure or create specific intermediary choke points in order to be able to actually catch uh, those infringers. And then there is also the possibility to actually control developers. So actually forcing the particular developer of a particular technology either at the blockchain level to implement specific mechanism uh, that will ignore specific transactions or that will create a particular flag for a tainted uh, transaction and so forth, but also at the level of the smart contract and providing like ob obliging specific uh, software developer to actually uh, codify specific backdoor or specific kill switch that a particular government authority has actually control over. And then same thing at the level of the hardware. So, uh, and again, this is kind of reminiscent of what happened like in the early days on the internet with the advent of uh, uh, cryptography in which we saw that there was the government that was trying to make pressure in order to actually, like doing the, the crypto war, in order to force device manufacturers to actually implement specific backdoor. And as we have seen, this is extremely problematic, one, because it's providing this power to this uh, third-party authority, but at the same time, because it can actually generate new vulnerabilities into the system. And what's also interesting about blockchains is they actually implement or there's a possibility for governments or other regulatory bodies to be involved in market-based regulations. So imagine a world where, um, where Bitcoin and, or Ethereum uh, is uh, uh, 20 times as large as it is today. It's not just storing access or records of uh, virtual currencies, but is also storing an increasing number of represented assets, including things like real property or stock certificates, 
or other valuable assets. But you can imagine at that point in time that uh, there'll be a desire for these networks to become more and more stable. And that governments may actually decide that they may want to get involved in the operation and maintenance of these networks in order to ensure some stability. So if you're recording some assets on a blockchain, uh, you know that the entire data structure won't be attacked by, let's say, a state actor or some other large party. Um, at the same time, by participating in the mining of these networks, you actually begin to uh, have some say in the way that these networks operate if there's an upgrade or a fork or some other sort of activity on the network. So you can imagine a world if blockchains become more and more important where governments begin to actually become involved in the validation and, and running of these networks. At the same time, if a government wanted to limit the ability of these networks to grow and develop, uh, it can impact the stability of the underlying assets that are useful for it. So on the network, uh, the Ethereum network, you actually have to buy Ether in order to run computer processes, the smart contract programs. And if the cost of running those processes is significantly higher, or if there's variable pricing that gets uh, implemented, such that a business or a service can't predict accurately how much it's going to cost for them to begin to run uh, and develop applications on top of it, it becomes much less attractive to use. So by impacting the stability of the underlying crypto uh, asset um, or crypto token, you can begin to impact its uh, mainstream use. And then finally, there is um, these um, kind of new possibilities that emerge as well in terms of identifying which one are the actors that actually have more influence over the networks. And so on the one hand, there is obviously the miners, which are the transaction processors, and which today are pretty much um, just ignoring the actual source or destination or typology of the transaction. They are basically just taking them and according to the transaction fee, they decide which one to incorporate in the next block. Um, what might happen is that those miners can actually receive some kind of pressure, either, whether this is like from a government that might say you actually need to ignore specific transactions which are coming from a particular source or towards a destination, or perhaps you can actually have uh, private actors that might actually create some external agreement with some of the mining pool and actually give them some financial uh, compensation to actually process their transaction um, more like sooner than the others. And in this case, we, we start seeing kind of the same question that are existing today in terms of network neutrality, but in the blockchain space. And already today, of course, the, the problem of blockchain neutrality already exists because it, already the processing of the transaction depends on the transaction fee that is actually being put for each transaction. But this is, to some extent, transparent, so we can actually see who is putting which transaction fee and therefore why a transaction is being processed faster. Whereas by creating those external agreement or because of governmental pressure, then we might actually be in a situation in which by just looking at the blockchain, we don't know that some transactions are actually being um, either prioritize or perhaps deprioritize or, or eventually even censored. And then there is the, uh, another really critical question, which is actually identifying who are the super nodes of a particular blockchain network. So even though it is a completely decentralized network and this intermediated, there are some actors that actually have more influence than others. And those are, for instance, the, the exchanges, those are the blockchain explorer, those are potentially the large commerce, commercial actors that are accepting cryptocurrencies, and those actors are basically the ones that will decide what is the most relevant blockchain. And so if we actually decide or impose a particular restriction, either on the exchanges saying that they could not actually enable any transaction uh, towards an account or towards a particular uh, or, or preventing transactions that are issued, perhaps in the past, because the transaction history is transparent, you can actually identify what, what is called the taintness of the transaction. So what is the probability and what is the percentage of this transaction that comes from a particular account which is held to be uh, a criminal account or whatever. And so we can actually impose, or a government could impose on the exchanges the restriction that they should not process those, uh, those transactions, which will literally uh, uh, disrupt the neutrality of the, of the blockchain. Um, and, and same thing like for the commercial operator. If the commercial operator is only following a particular blockchain which operates according to specific rules, and we decide, for instance, that there will be a hard fork uh, requiring that specific uh, accounts are ignored, then 
most likely everyone will essentially follow that fork just because the large super nodes are actually endorsing this one as opposed to one that did not actually implement the fork. Um, and in much in the same way, you know, these blockchain-based networks are fairly new. And it's unclear right now whether or not uh, the existing blockchain-based networks will be the final version of what uh, eventually could, main, uh, could, could achieve scale. Uh, so there's a number of technological limitations that limit the number of transactions that can be processed by these networks, the speed of these networks. Uh, there's questions related to the uh, privacy that these networks pro can provide. And there's a number of computer scientists and other developers that are trying to solve these problems. Uh, so uh, at this point in time, we're still at the very early days of, of blockchain technology. You know, this may very well be the first inning instead of the you know, fourth or fifth or sixth inning uh, of, of the game. Uh, so there's an uh, immense opportunity for, regu uh, for regulators to get involved in actually shaping the development of how these networks operate. And we've already learned from the existing blockchain-based networks that these networks tend to develop different social norms. So for Bitcoin, uh, there seems to be a collective desire uh, to achieve uh, near-perfect immutability or having a data structure that will never change. Uh, that's something that collectively a number of the participants in that network value. We've seen with the Ethereum network that they've been less um, sensitive to those concerns and have been willing to actually modify uh, the blockchain and upgrade uh, their blockchain to permit some transactions to be unwound uh, if they think that it may have had a socially negative impact on the rest of the technology, on, on the rest of the network. So we can imagine over time laws, regulations, or governments getting involved in this process so we can build a blockchain that hopefully can achieve um, all of its benefits while uh, potentially limiting some of its downsides. And then another uh, element that we then explore in the book is uh, this shift towards the notion of code is law, which uh, essentially illustrates the idea that increasingly on the internet we are actually relying on infrastructure and technology to act as a particular regulatory mechanism, um, which are rules dictated by the platform operator. And in the case of code as law, uh, the distinction is really when blockchain technology is actually being used as a regulatory technology in order to achieve specific regulatory objectives through a technological mean. And this is the this is the, the, the new opportunity that is provided by smart contract to the extent that we can now have specific smart contract designed on purpose to actually implement specific legal rules um, and which might be deployed by either government authority and then requiring that specific transaction actually go through those smart contracts or perhaps uh, being implemented by uh, companies or by the civil society but following the rules that a particular governmental authority has uh, established. And then, so as we have seen uh, with the internet, thanks to the internet, and I think by, by now we all agree on, is the idea that, of course, architecture is politics, and the technology obviously is not neutral, even though it has like those particular features, we can actually design this technology to, act, to have very different objective and outcomes. Um, and the, like, it can go from having this very socially beneficial platform that will actually enable more emancipation, more freedom of expression, um, and provide more transparency and accountability. We can also use the same technology to actually create those autonomous um, systems that are actually not regulable to, and that uh, will actually promote this vision of like crypto anarchy. At the same time, the same technology can then be used either by corporation or by governmental authority to actually create a totalitarian space of like self-executing rules in which automatically every uh, rule will be automatically enforced by the text by the technology and really you know what what this all highlights uh, is the importance of governance uh, so the emerging issues and most critical issues with the blockchain technology space is these these networks are not going away they seem incre increasingly important and governance is going to play an increasingly important role in shaping how this technology develops you know, do we want uh, blockchain-based networks to be socially beneficial, or do we want, uh, do we want uh, some of the uh, other effects that Primavera just mentioned? And what's, in, what's important is that there's uh, two different emerging uh, modes of governance that are being explored by those that are developing the technology, both looking at how you can uh, shape governance through the infrastructure itself, through the code that's in the networks. Uh, that's often called on-chain governance. Uh, 
Um, and then there's also just the surrounding ecosystem and shaping that surrounding uh, ecosystem that is supporting a blockchain uh, in order to implement some sort of governmental uh, governance uh, rules that's often referred to as off-chain governance. And then one, one important element that needs to be identified is that for every layers on the blockchain, then we can see that there is a distinction between endogenous rules, which are the rules that are defined by the community and for the community. So in the case of a blockchain, it's the blockchain protocol. In the case of a blockchain-based application, it's the actual code of the smart contract. And then we have the exogenous rules, which are actually rules that are generally imposed by a third party of a particular community. And what we notice, at least today, is that initially most of the focus in the blockchain space was on um, governance by the infrastructure and endogenous rule, which may, means like what are the particular governance system that we can bake directly into the technological tool in order to actually create a particular governance. So m most of the cases, like what are the particular protocol that, and consensus algorithm that we, that we will embed into the blockchain system, and in the case of the smart contract, so what is the governance structure that operates this particular smart contract. And then increasingly, especially because of the specific uh, problems that have emerged in the, in the last few months, uh, essentially not, noticing that there can be sometimes mistakes and bugs into the actual technology. And so when we realize that the governance by the infrastructure is not sufficient because the design was actually had a vulnerability or a flaw, then we need to actually think about the governance of the infrastructure, and that is how do we actually change uh, or how do we even define the rules of the infrastructure through a more social or institutional mechanism. And this is where the community social norm actually come into play. And also there are some procedures that have been uh, stipulated by different communities. So in the case of Bitcoin, we have the Bitcoin improvement proposal. Uh, with Ethereum, we have the Ethereum improvement proposal, which are all based on the social norm. There is no authority that is actually enforcing those norms, but the community as a as a general consensus, has decided to actually abide by this process. So those are all rules that are endogenous to a particular community. And what has not yet been explored until now, but actually we're starting to see that they are actually very relevant, are all the exogenous rules that might affect a particular blockchain-based system. And whether those exogenous rules can be technologically, so this is the actual uh, software and hardware constraints that will be implemented, but also on the bottom layer of the internet, we can actually affect the governance of a particular blockchain-based system by affecting the governance of the underlying framework on which it operates. And, and then finally, and this is the reason why we actually wrote this book, is those exo exogenous rules that are actually non-technical, and this is mostly basically laws and regulation, which obviously will and can impact the governance of a particular blockchain-based system, and to some extent, what, we, what, what is lacking today is actually this bridge between those endogenous and exogenous rules. And that's, you know, that's really the tension that we explore in the book. It's this tension between these new code-based systems uh, and the rule of code that they, uh, uh, they implement uh, with the rule of law. And it's going to be this interaction that I think is going to be really interesting. I think it's also going to play a huge role in just shaping how this technology uh, develops. Thank you. Thank you so much. And if anybody has any questions, um, just raise your hand, and I'll come over to you with this mic. Thanks, guys. Um, one idea that you raised that's really interesting to me is the idea of a government exerting some level of control on a blockchain-based ecosystem by being a participant, something that really hadn't crossed my mind before. Uh, do you think that proof-of-stake consensus protocols would be particularly vulnerable to that type of effort by a government? In, I would say that probably both any consensus mechanism would be. So proof of work, um, if a government wanted to participate, and again, we're not advocate, necessarily advocating for it, we're just flagging it as a potential avenue for regulation. Uh, governments can buy hardware, uh, they can uh, get electricity at a lower cost than potentially the, the private sector, and, um, and operate machines in order to, uh, to begin to do that validation process. Uh, that could be actually a net positive, right? 
again, imagine more and more assets being managed by these systems. At this point in time, uh, at least last time I checked, it cost about two plus billion dollars to modify a record on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, so, you know, that's not something most private actors can, can do, but for a state actor, it's actually, it's not in, it's a significant sum, but not out of reach. Uh, so if we really want to put trillions of dollars of assets onto these systems and have blockchains manage trillions of dollars worth of assets, really state actors are going to have to contemplate participating on these networks. With proof of stake, uh, it's based on fundamentally, you know, how much of the underlying uh, token do you, do you own? Again, a government could purchase a number of those tokens and begin to uh, pro uh, uh, participate on the network. I think, it, I think proof of stake, they're still working out a number of different issues related to it, so it's unclear how it's going to operate, but I don't think that that is out of reach, potentially. Yeah, and I can add that actually there are, there are two layers to actually analyze as to like which one will be the most likely to be potentially co-opted by government, and one is uh, to, which, to which extent the government can actually engage into like the actual mining, so whether whether by purchasing the token and becoming a validator in the case of proof of stake, or by actually purchasing the necessary hardware for mining, and then there is the question of to which extent those different consensus protocol will lead to more or less concentration. Which means that if, like in the case of proof of work, we have seen that actually because of the economies of scale, then there is this tendency of concentration. And as time goes, you just get those growing uh, large mining pools, which themselves can then be easily regulated because they become a centralized intermediary to some extent. And so the question is, when we, like between proof of work and proof of stake, the government can either engage directly by actually purchasing the necessary resources to influence the decision and the consensus, or they can identify whether this actually leads to those specific concentration and choke point and then actually regulate those. And both, both proof of work and proof of stake actually have those questions, those problem of concentration and centralization, at least up to now. Um, your first slide uh, talked about public blockchains, made a very important point about that. Uh, a lot of the economic activity, the investment in blockchain technology also goes into private blockchains. How does that interact with this progression that you're describing? I mean, the, like, the, 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 we precise it in the beginning because actually the whole book is looking at the, the question of like this Lex Cryptographica and rule of code and to which extent it's actually different from Lex Informatica is actually the fact that there is no centralized operator or identifiable actor that actually can influence the execution of this technological system. So a private blockchain does not really lead to any new challenges because a private blockchain is actually controlled at least by a consortium of identifiable actors, which actually is pretty much the same as code is law as we have known it until now. Whereas, and this is why we decide to focus on public blockchain, they actually introduce this new feature which actually create the autonomy and the disintermediation, which creates a lot of new legal challenges that did not exist or not to the same manner in the traditional Lex Informatica. But we, we may see a blending of permissioned and private blockchains with public blockchains. So some people have used the analogy that uh, permissioned and or uh, private blockchains are kind of like intranets from the uh, early 1990s, and eventually that gave way to the public internet. Uh, so uh, if that is the way things develop, then um, we're going to see a lot of interest in permissioned and, and private blockchains um, going forward. At the same time, a lot of what we're talking about here is financial regulation, so you can imagine uh, certain uh, impetuses to actually begin to uh, construct or manage that activity through permission blockchains. It's, it's too, too, too soon to tell which way it's going to develop. Hi, I really like that your approach was a more scientific, let's look at what is and ask questions rather than try to give answers like you try to cover uh, the questions. Uh, but for those of us who also like answers, do you have a pre either pre predictions or recommendations as to the future of whether things are going to go more the totalitarian way or more the anarchistic way? How, what can we do? What do you think will happen and what do you think we can do to have things in one way or the other? So my personal belief that you know, blockchains, I think, right now are kind of in the 
crypto anarchy phase where it's assumed that laws and regulations may not apply, uh, certain activity uh, may, may violate existing laws and regulations. I do think over time as people really understand these choke points and pressure points, uh, much like with the internet, once they begin to understand how to regulate certain intermediaries and shape laws that were appropriate for the internet, we may see uh, a similar trend here where there's an increasing amount of regulation that applies to the technology uh, and some of the anarchic tendencies are, are tamed or, or tamped down. You just hope that it doesn't go too far uh, where we do get that totalitarian uh, state towards the end. At least that would be my hope. Yeah. And I think, I think you, you actually need to look at the adoption curve. So in the same way as like with the internet initially, the early internet pioneers were you know, researchers or like those uh, cypher punks and things like that, people that were looking at how this technology can, how, how do you push the boundaries and how, what, what can you do with this new technological tool in order to promote individual emancipation, freedom of expression and so forth. And then slowly we see that you have more and more commercial actors that actually enter and then the narrative change, right? Because everyone is trying to use the technology in order to further their own interest. And then eventually because commercial actors come in, then the government needs also to look at this technology and regulate it and eventually might figure out, well, actually, we can also use this technology as in order to further our, our own interests, right? And so it's just like the technology will always be used by, like, as the particular stakeholder group needs to use it. And I think in the blockchain is the same. At the beginning, we had this very strong, like, crypto-anarchist or crypto-libertarian narrative, and most of the usages of the technology was focusing on that, because that, that was the actual user base, right? And then slowly, we have the financial sector that gets interested in it and is actually exploring very different usages. And then we have the commercial operator, and then we have the speculator, and then we have now increasingly the government that is also trying to look what, what can we do with this technology. So... It's actually going to go in all the direction, but it's just going to be representative to the different size of the stakeholder group. And obviously, the crypto anarchists will always exist, and they will always look at what kind of usages they can do of this technology. But the mainstream use is obviously going to be the commercial operator, and that will pretty much be designed in order to further those interests. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so I'll ask my question and also give you a little context to why I ask it. My question is, is a public blockchain, uh, can, can the public blockchain exist without cryptocurrencies or do you think uh, they're both joined at the hip and interrelated, interconnected? The reason I ask that is, uh, so I'm a, I'm a lawyer and we are currently in the Supreme Court in India, uh, challenging the, most, the recent circular of our central bank, pulling the plug on cryptocurrencies earlier in the month, basically saying no more banking uh, for cryptocurrency businesses. And one of the key arguments of the debate that's going on is when the government says that blockchain is good, we support the technology, but we are concerned about cryptocurrencies, that particular application. The debate that we are trying to you know, kind of find an answer to is that it is, even, is it even possible to do that? Uh, or, or is it just, uh, you know, that, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's not possible and you cannot have one without the other? That's a great question. I don't know if we'll be able to fully answer it since we're not uh, computer signed. Tests, but uh, I mean, uh, permission blockchains uh, currently don't have uh, tokens or some other cryptocurrency that are necessary for them to operate. Uh, you know, public blockchains assume that everybody is a bad actor, um, and they use these tokens in order to reach that common point of consensus. Uh, in the case of Bitcoin, it's about every ten minutes. In the case of Ethereum, it's about every ten to twelve seconds. Uh, particularly with Ethereum, if you want to run these uh, decentralized applications, if you want to actually run uh, the computer code necessary uh, to support these applications, you need a token. Uh, because if it's not there, then this world computer, which is one way to think about what Ethereum is, it would seize up. So think about when you open up too many files on your computer and the computer freezes. It freezes because you've effectively uh, DDoSed your own computer, right? You've, you've sent it too many requests and it just it's saying, please stop. Uh, well, if you have a, a, a global world computer, People can send in requests into that computing system and slow it down or seize it up. So you actually need this token in order to meter the activity and prevent that abuse. Uh, so it has a strong utility component to it. And so to the extent that that trusted computing environment is valuable, um, presumably you would need that uh, some sort of token in order to meter that activity, at least as blockchains are currently conceived today. <laughs> 
Yeah, if, if I can add it, it's like from a game theory or economic perspective, it's like the concept of like a club good, right? So if you have a public common pool resources, then either you have not enough contribution or you have the risk of overexploitation. And so you need to create some kind of governance mechanism that will ensure that the resource actually survive the use. And uh, but if you don't have a centralized institution that can actually impose and enforce those rules, then you need to identify like a decentralized mechanism to do that. And like the token is literally this this mechanism that converts this public common pool resource into an actual club good, so that you actually identify the optimal. Um, positioning of how much people are, can use it, and as more people actually want to use it, then it has this inherent recursive mechanism that the value of the of the token or the cryptocurrency is increasing, and therefore automatically more people will be incentivized to provide the resources. And so, the, like it's actually a really elegant system in order to enable a public uh, resources to actually scale and like to be elastic to the actual demand. And eventually to incentivize and incentivize contribution and disincentivize over exploitation, and so the, the challenge. And I, I don't think there is any solution at the moment, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. But the challenge is how do you actually ensure this kind of decentralized governance without this economic tool that is the native cryptocurrency of the blockchain? Yeah. I guess another way to think of it, you know these tokens solve some commons problems that exist on these blockchain-based networks. Uh, hello. First, I'd like to apologize for buying your book on Amazon and not on a decentralized thing that would enable you to get more royalties per book. Um, we won't hold it against you. Yeah. Uh, it seems like most of the ways of uh, a government or any group of humans will manage, will make a blockchain do what they want, um, despite the blockchain's objection, are from the exogenous forces, right? Um, but if the underlying hardware changes, like to the, through mesh nets, right, instead of internets with ISPs, would that just take the wind out of the sails? I know that there's already a, uh, a startup that connects, you can connect your uh, Bitcoin node to a satellite and then you don't need an internet connection, you just have to have a radio transmitter and a dish and you're on the Bitcoin network. You, and Anyway, so there's a lot of uh, hardware ways people can, can get around a lot of the ways that um, regulation might come. Um, are there any, your thoughts on that? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I think in, in many ways those intermediaries, uh, they exist and maybe there's some technological solutions to, to guard against uh, any uh, application of some law regulation, uh, it, I think it could play out a lot like copyright, right? So we saw uh, Napster emerge, it facilitated copyright infringement, at least as viewed by the U.S. courts, and over time we saw technological responses to Napster. So the, one of the core issues with Napster was there was a centralized index. So uh, lots of really talented developers said, well, how can we build a similar system without a centralized index? And we saw things like uh, Nutella emerge, we saw things like BitTorrent em emerge, I think here we're already seeing some early indication of technologists responding to uh, regulatory um, pressure and or laws that are being applied. So for example, Bitcoin emerged, it was thought it was anonymous. It was kind of presented that way. It turned out it was not anonymous. Um, so we've seen a, a great deal of effort put into building more anonymous uh, virtual currencies. So things like Zcash and Monero and other examples. And do they function as well right now as, as Bitcoin? Not necessarily, but they could in the future. At the same time, we're seeing more pressure being applied on the exchanges, where they're going to have to comply with uh, uh, traditional financial services regulations. We're seeing a movement to build decentralized exchanges, or exchanges that are not um, that are not centrally maintained, but are maintained by usually one or more smart contract program. And then the question becomes, you know, will that attract the same uh, the same level of usage, will they be able to actually handle the same amount of volume as these centralized exchanges? And at the same time, will people trust them enough? Right? It may be, maybe these laws and regulations actually have a utility, a use outside of uh, just being kind of a thorn in the side of, of some developers. Yeah, and I think, I mean, this goes back to the concept of like, no blockchain is an island. Um, so you can have a particular technological infrastructure, but 
you actually want to interact with that particular technological infrastructure and there is all the different actors that need to that provide the gateway, the bridge between them, and that's actually where you actually can make pressure. So the idea is not that there will always be a gray or black blockchain, right? But the question is, how do you avoid this to becoming like the mainstream system? And you cannot, like, unless you have a completely totalitarian internet uh, censorship and regulation, then you will never be able to prevent those people with the satellite. But those people with the satellite might not be able to actually interact with exchanges, with uh, blockchain explorer, with commercial actor and so forth. And so the question is, and, and it's just like the internet, the internet we always will have like some kind of uh, you know, gray market and like tar and like some kind of thing that cannot be regulated. And then the danger is is exactly that: is that as you as technology moves towards those more decentralized system, the law to some extent will try to find that the rule of law will always try and find a way to control and to regulate those those actors. And the technology will always find a way to escape from the law. But the, and that's the danger. And I think that's actually what we have seen with the internet: is that as we move towards more decentralized system, we, we actually observe more and more draconian regulation, and those regulations affect everyone, right? And the people that know how to escape those regulations, the people that know how to develop new technology or use those new technology, they will always escape from the law, but in the, in the meantime, we have those regulations that actually apply to everybody else, that actually did not intend to do any of those illegitimate actions, and this is, like, this is the danger, right? It's like we are entering into this race, in which we have laws regulating technology, technology becoming more unregulatable and there are more law happening to, the, to, to push the boundaries, but then it's affecting everything in between. And that's why we need to get the regulation right here. Uh, hello. So um, due to my background, I guess, uh, when I hear things like um, uh, the rule of code, my, my mind automatically wanders towards um, the free and open source licensing uh, world. And I, I was uh, wondering whether you think there's some overlap or influence that's gonna happen towards regulation, the regulation domain of uh, blockchains based on how uh, many of the implementations are uh, using uh, free software licensing. Uh, did you see any connection between those two things or I'm just seeing things? There, I mean, there's definitely an overlap in the community. Uh, so folks that tend to be interested in uh, free and open source software have have seemed to have gravitated into this space. You know. I'm not sure I understood the question, <laughs> but um, I think that the like I guess the similarity is in the sense that when you create an open source software, then anyone else can take that software and develop it as they wish, and in the same way, and you have this kind of like exit based mechanism. And in the same case, like with a blockchain, if it's like an open source blockchain, then you can always, if you disagree, for instance, like in terms of regulation, if there is an actual hard fork that is implemented in order to censor something or to just like make a change in which the, the way in which the protocol work, then anyone is actually free because it's under an open license to take that code and fork it in a different way or just not actually accept that particular modification. And so, you like the difference is uh, I guess it's not necessarily the difference, but you you cannot enforce a particular adoption of a change that has been implemented in the network, and you cannot force, for instance, even if the if the government was to oblige a group of developers to implement a particular feature that the community does not agree with, then either they don't actually update their client and then they stay, or they can take the code, change it, and do something different. And then you have this kind of plebiscite power in which people are just going to follow the fork that they enjoy the most. So the, like, I guess the, the connection between like, the open source um, of the, the licenses that applies to those network is that it enables anyone to actually exit if they are not happy or just not to adopt the change that has been imposed upon them. Like you, you basically cannot impose a particular change and you cannot prevent a network from evolving in a particular direction, at least not by relying on the traditional uh, copyright um, mechanism. It's like a free and open source network or something like that. We talked about this race um, between 
regulating the centralized intermediaries and incentivizing decentralized technologies to escape that. So what's a way for regulation to, disinf to disincentivize actually making decentralized alternatives to the centralized intermediaries? I don't think you can. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't think you. I don't think you can have a, a law that prevents people from experimenting with decentralized alternatives, um, and I, and because of that, I think the the change. Like, how do we stop this loop? Right? How do we stop this cycle, which is going towards more decentralization, more regulation? I think it's actually by the blockchain-based communities to come up with specific governance structures that will show that they are actually able to self-regulate themselves, right? So if you have, for instance, like some criminal smart contract or some criminal content stored on a blockchain-based system, um, how do we actually act as a blockchain-based community in order to give a possibility to the actual users or to the actual stakeholder of this network to decide whether they want to endorse this particular blockchain or whether they actually want to have a blockchain that does not host this content, right? And at the moment, it's really difficult because at the moment, there is actually no governance structure around this. So it's, 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 it's like, there, like there, there, is no, there is no specifically designed solution. So people just will choose and you need a developer that actually will implement a particular alternative will change the protocol and decide by their own that we don't want to host this particular type of content. But the question is, how does the community as a whole decide? And at the moment, the developers, they have a very strong power because they are the ones that can implement the protocol change. And the question is, how do we make sure that this decision that is taken by the developers actually reflect the decision of the actual blockchain community? And if the blockchain community... So and that's, that goes back to the endogenous and exogenous rules, right? So if we can figure out a set of endogenous rules that to some extent comply with like the society's social norms, with the external regulation, then there will be no need for the law to actually expand in order to cover and in order to prevent specific uses of the technology because there will be this form of self-governance. So I think for me, it's, it's up to like the the actual blockchain community to come up with like those proper endogenous rules that will ensure that this race does not actually go too far. That will prevent, that will prevent um, governments from wanting to regulate it. That seems, to me, that seems uh, not super realistic, but that is my view. To come up with the rules, or yeah, what? so what's an example of some rules that some, you know, public blockchains right now could implement that you think would uh, reduce the incentive for governments to write, you know, to want to regulate them in some way or right. get involved in regulation? Yeah, well, I think what so there's a tension between transparency and privacy. So obviously, uh, you know. We cherish financial privacy. Right? People don't tend to like to disclose um, their assets or what they make on a, a, a given year. With, for example, Bitcoin, let's imagine a world where every, everybody's using Bitcoin for, for every transaction. You can actually de-anonymize the network in different ways and understand what people's assets are. I don't think that's necessarily something that most, uh, most people in society, at least society today, would feel comfortable with. So you know, maybe there's techniques or other different rules that can be put in place where we can begin to preserve uh, financial privacy in some instances, but also uh, create transparency when that's needed. And there's a number of projects that are kind of exploring that dynamic between the two. There's no answers yet, but you can imagine kind of a state uh, that emerges where we preserve some of the financial privacy, but at the same time um, per permit disclosures in order to prevent bad actors from abusing the system. That may be one example. And I think we have other examples that are actually happening right now, uh, which is, so at the moment, there is the, the Ethereum network, which actually has a lot of contentious questions as to whether or not to recover some funds, as to, you know, there is, there is, there is actually contentious. And the, the interesting thing is that um, 
normal iterisa process, which is the Ethereum improvement process, which is actually meant to upgrade and to modify the government's BIDE infrastructure. Um, but this, this process is actually mostly oriented towards technical changes. Right? And now there is this big discussion, this big debate that is happening because there is proposals to actually change the protocol, not because of a technical problem, but because of a political question. Right? There, a decision needs to be made, and everybody knows what the technical solution is. There is no contention about that. The question is, are we, as this undefined community, to implement this particular change in the protocol in order to recover funds that were that are stuck because of a particular problem, even though this is not necessary for the survival of the network, but this is perhaps necessary because we, as a community, undefined community, we actually have specific, specific values and specific norms by which we think that it is okay to recover the funds if they have been stolen or if they have been frozen because of a particular reason. And this is the process that needs to be figured out. There is no, no formal or informal process to actually take this decision. And there is no consensus as to how to act about this decision or about the fact that there is a lack of consensus. So the question is really like, can, and we don't know yet, but can the community actually come up with specific governance processes or specific governance tools that will enable to resolve those problems when there is a political contentious issues as opposed to just a technical one? I think you actually just answered most of my question, but I, I was really interested in the uh, decentralized in endogenous governance and, you know, what other concerns do you have in terms of, like, emergent power structures that are going to come from that? So right now, the, the power does rest with the developers in terms of fiscal power, political power, um, but even if we were to distribute that more equitably, you'd still have problems like tyranny of the majority or issues like that, um, where in our democracy we need the courts to resolve issues around that. So, um, do you have any insights on, into how those can be overcome on on blockchain or within a community? I guess there's kind of layers of powers that we've already seen emerge in these blockchain-based systems. So the miners have some degree of power, right? They ultimately vote and decide if they want to do a protocol up upgrade of some sort. Uh, we've seen that the developers themselves have a, a significant amount of power. They're the ones that implement changes, and they're going to discuss and decide whether or not it's technically feasible or, like Primavera mentioned, socially desirable in order to implement these changes. Uh, we're also seeing you know, members in the ecosystem that have a significant amount of power as well, like exchanges. So exchanges can decide whether or not they're going to recognize you know, one fork of a blockchain over another. They are determining whether or not certain assets are going to be uh, traded or not. Uh, and rules uh, that relate to who will have access to, uh, you know, to some of the blockchain-based applications and services that emerge. So I think there's definitely, you know, early indications of layers of, of power within these networks. And then I think it, it, that's an area that needs a significant amount of exploration of how those interact and how those disputes are going to get resolved between those parties. I want to add something. Um, I think that the, the blockchain actually has a particularity in which uh, the problem is not actually the uh, dictature of the majority, because actually you cannot impose anything to anyone, right? There is no even if like miners majoritarily decide to mine a particular chain rather than another, no one is forcing me to go to that chain. I can still stay on another chain. Right? So the majority is kind of weird because, of course, perhaps the value of the token on one network is higher than the other, but no one can actually impose any user, even if it's the majority. And you can have like a 49, 51%, and then it's quite a problem. right? So the, as opposed to traditional centralized platform in which actually you have the problem if you have like a democratic governance, then you will have the dictature of the majority. In a blockchain-based system, you have different problem, which is the tyranny of structurelessness, which basically means that it's actually really hard to understand who is in power and who has control and who has higher amount of influence than another, right? And so when you have a institutional or bureaucratic process for governance, then you have some kind of accountability. You know who is taking the decision. You also can appeal a particular decision if you think it has not been taken according to the right procedure. Whereas when you enter into a blockchain-based system, because there is no formal 
governance system, then you actually do have those kind of invisible powers, but they are not accountable. There's no accountability because you don't actually know who is really making the decision. You just have those different clusters which are interacting one with the other and trying to exert more or less pressure without really being able to impose anything. But of course you have like, you know, the, well, you have people like Vitalik and like people that have much more influence than other, but you also have actors which like specific mining pool might have more power and things like this, but it's really hard to actually know how a decision is made, who is responsible for that decision and who are the different actors which are on which side, right? So the, the, and this is a very interesting problem that, that emerges that because it's so decentralized and because it's so informal in, in the manner of like the decision making, then you actually have this different kind of tyranny, which is not the majority one. And I think that's, I think that's why we're seeing, you know, some, you know, next generation blockchains trying to add more formal structure and how some of, some, some of this process may emerge. So. Uh, I just wanted to ask a quick question to build on that and about communication of the development of blockchain and how as we kind of grow this technology, how we're um, building understanding and consensus with the rest of the world who we're hoping will adopt this technology in the future. Uh, because it seems like we ran into a lot of problems with the development of the internet of a lot of people being uh, having a fear reaction to this new technology and how it's going to change their lives. And that's kind of how we ended up with like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, so what 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 is the community doing now or what, what are you seeing or kind of what are the trends that could develop in a way to get ahead of some of that fear that it kind of been made known, like decentralized, anything decentralized, anything with anarchistic tendencies tends to be met with a lot of fear. I mean, I think one thing is, at least today, the, the, the parties that are developing the technology are much more widely dispersed than I think they were uh, when the internet emerged. So a, a lot of the development happens with teams that are not located in one physical location. Uh, they're scattered across the globe. You, you hope that uh, some of those voices get kind of instilled and uh, baked into the underlying technology itself. So I, I think that's one positive note, at least. And, you know, I think, so, you, know, you know, there's lots of problems with social media, but a lot of this is hashed out in, the, in public, uh, you know, on, uh, through social media, through um, things like Reddit posts and, uh, and in-person meetings. And I do think that um, there is a, quite a number of different voices from different parts of the globe that are uh, involved in the development of the technology. Even if you think about the most, some of the major exchanges, they're not based in the US, they're based in, in Asia, right? Um, in Japan or, or in South Korea, et cetera. Uh, so I, I do think that there, it's a little bit more of a global movement than, than uh, maybe the first internet was, which really seemed to come out of mostly from the US. They're like very tech savvy and at the forefront of these emerging technologies. And with that comes kind of almost an inability to understand what a beginner looks like. Uh, and then how, and, and those beginners tend to be like the people who are in the government or in other, these other regulatory bodies that their knee jerk reaction is, 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 tends to be a very fear response reaction. So, I'm just wondering, having seen how people view like the exchanges and the blockchain now, um, it seems like there's already a lot of misinformation happening. Uh, and I'm wondering like what can be done on the side of the creators to build a space that feels more accessible to people who don't understand it. Yeah, I, I agree. I think this is this is a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, I think it's it's starting. Like I, I can notice like a big difference when I was talking about the blockchain two years ago, and literally no one uh, could actually interact. Whereas now you actually have very interesting feedback and, and sometimes not. And the danger now, I think, is kind of that up to two years ago, people knew they didn't know, and so they were kind of like eager to learn, whereas what happened now, I think, is that some people think they know, whereas they don't know. 
And that's the dangerous part, right? And, and they also are communicating what they think they know, but they actually don't know. And uh, it's, it's, it's quite challenging to really like know very well. You know, like it takes a lot of effort to really deep dive into this. And I think there is kind of a responsibility to try and communicate as well as possible in order to actually inform people and like get them to actually experiment also with this technology. But that's a, I, I don't have the solution to this, but you know, read the book. <laughs> that's the beginning. <laughs> we have time for one more question. I did see a, I thought I saw a new hand up here. If not, I will give you the last honor. Um, thanks. Um, you were quite clear about the importance of uh, self-governance and uh, and uh, the uh, for uh, these uh, groups to self-regulate uh, in order to solve this uh, this problem. Uh, were you also did you did I also hear you say that? the ability to manage tokens as part of this process is essential. In other words, having um, uh, the economic incentives around a FAT protocol or around uh, a governance mechanism um, is going to be have to be part of the solution that you're seeing in terms of self-regulation. So I think... I think the answer is yes. I mean, so if a blockchain is increasingly going to manage more and more assets, then the question of custody and maintaining control over those assets is going to become uh, essential for it to develop into a mainstream technology. Uh, so, you know, we've, uh, we, we may have built the bank, but we haven't built the bank vaults yet. So I think uh, that's an important uh, challenge. I don't think anybody actually knows how to build uh, uh, secure systems or systems that are secure enough for people to uh, feel like they're not going to necessarily lose their assets. At the same time, questions of asset recovery or or uh, being able to recover lost assets, I think, soften some of the uh, some of the more um, stringent parts of the way that these blockchain-based networks operate. I think that's probably an area where uh, block, the blockchain-based ecosystem differs uh, radically from the way we deal with uh, assets today. You usually don't. Uh, have somebody take your assets and you're never able to recover them. We have various different ways to kind of soften that blow. I, I was trying to ask, are you saying that these problems will be solved one blockchain at a time or one token at a time? That was my question. Uh, let's see. Um, so I think, I, I, I think that, that there are like different layers to answer this question. Uh, in the case of public blockchain, so, so the, 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 the idea that you actually need a token is actually how do you govern a particular public blockchain without a particular institution around it. I think that there is an actual danger um, in the sense, I mean, this, is, this goes to my next part of the research, but um, I think if you look at most of the governance structure that have been deployed so far in the blockchain-based systems, it's oftentimes based on this kind of market-based or plutocratic model. Right, so whether it's uh, hashing power, whether it's how many tokens you have in deposit for proof of stake, or when you actually look at the application on top of a blockchain, oftentimes it's uh, token-based governance. And so it's, it's always looking at market-based system. And my, my belief or my intuition will be that we, are we have a decentralized infrastructure and we're trying to design a decentralized governance structure on top. And what we know today, the closest thing that we know that is a decentralized governance structure is a market-based system. The problem is that if the goal is to actually have a decentralized system, then it's kind of dangerous to rely on a, on a, on a, on a market-based system because we, we well know that without a particular institution protecting them, then market oftentimes concentrate. And so it's kind of like ironic or paradoxical that if the goal, is, if the ultimate goal is actually decentralization, it's not enough to actually have a decentralized infrastructure and a theoretically decentralized governance structure on top of it, because in practice it's actually going to concentrate. And we have seen it with like the mining pool and we have seen it like in the various applications. So I think, and that goes back to like the endogenous rules, I think what we need to focus on, and some projects are actually starting to focus on this, is how do we actually design distributed governance systems, which are not necessarily based on a market-based or token-based mechanism, in order to actually design like decentralized structure, which are not necessarily based on a plutocracy. And we are, I think we are still at the beginning, but there is an increasing amount of projects that are actually exploring this. Uh, so I hope that eventually we will not always have to vote with our tokens.
All right. Well, please join me in thanking Primavera and Aaron. And just a reminder, we do have some of these beautiful books on sale, and uh, they'll be sticking around after the talk for a little bit, as well as joining us in the pub for a celebration of this, uh, of this book. Thank you so much. Thank you.